Hello everybody, you are very welcome to Writer's Block and I'm so delighted to have with me today Kovri Madhavan, one of our finest writers today, <laughs> living here since she was 25 years old and a, a, a great uh, writer, three books to her name now. How are you? Where are you at the moment? Tell us. Uh, Miriam, I'm here in down in West Cork uh, in the Barra Peninsula in Glengariff. Uh, I've uh, come away, got away from my family for a few, uh, couple of weeks just to kickstart my next book. And uh, that's, what I'm, uh, that's what I've been doing for the last few weeks. So the fourth book is on the way? It is. <laughs> and tell us it just... Is, yes, it's actually... Yeah, go ahead. Just tell us briefly, what is, what is this one about? What's, have you a working title for it yet? I do. It's called The Inheritance. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it's set entirely in West Cork. It's set in the Berra Peninsula. Oh, lovely! And, uh, it's set in the late yeah late eighties. So uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I've spent the last few weeks just uh, you know just getting my my um, you know my location and uh, just timelines and things in my head and. Um, yeah, it's going to be set around, around about the 1988-89 period and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. It's a fully, a fully Irish book this time. And, and that, was, that was a really good time. I mean, that was, I, I know I would have been about 24, 25 at the time and there's a, there was yeah. a lot going on in the world, a lot of change Absolutely. taking place in yeah, Ireland yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I have to say there was not a lot going on in Bear at, the, at that time, you know. Uh, it was it was a, a sleepy sort of sleepy corner of uh, of the sleepy westernmost corner southwesternmost corner of Europe, and not much going on you know in the Bear Peninsula. But you know I'm 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 hoping I'm going to get a good story out of this. So. Oh, I'm sure you will. And and have you any thoughts on on a possible projected publication date for that, or is that too early? Yes, no, 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 no. Um, it's uh, I think February twenty two. Is, oh. is what the public are looking at, yeah. Oh, we'll questions. all be looking out for that one, absolutely. <laughs> Inheritance, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Now, you have, at the moment, you have a, a book out, The Tainted. Yes. Wonderful book, absolutely wonderful book. I read it during the week. Oh my goodness. I mean, you're looking at so many different aspects of identity and culture yeah. and belonging and illegitimacy. Oh, and, and mutiny, of course, you know, yes, um, yes. and oh gosh, I mean, what was, what was your inspiration for that book? Did you want it to be a primarily an historical book, looking mainly at the, the, how the regiment, the Connacht Rangers, were involved in, in the mutiny um, of, of uh, the early 1920s, or, or was it to be a romance first? Well, no, Miriam, it was actually, it was, you know, I, I didn't set, set out wanting for it to be anything other than the story of the mutiny yes. um you know and whether that then became a historical fiction you know it's just the way it evolved obviously because of the, you know it's set in the 1920s yes. but uh, i certainly never set out planning to write a romance of any sort and um, that just happened it was i started the book wanting to write um you know the story of the mutiny and what happened to the mutineers when they came back to Ireland. Yes. Uh, but within the first within the first chapter, nearly, you know, when when Michael met Rose, uh, you know, she just took on a whole persona in the book, and you know, I was actually drawn then to her story. And uh, by by the time I wrote the third chapter, I knew that the book was not going to be about the mute the aftermath for the mutineers as much yes. as the aftermath for the people left behind, you know, the children and the, the, the progeny left behind by Irish soldiers, you know, through, through three, three, four hundred years, well, not four hundred years, but, you know, two, three hundred years of, of Irish being in India. It, it, isn't it extraordinary when something like that happens and suddenly you've got to stop and you realize that there's a sea change here and, yeah. and I'm going to have to run with that because your very gut is telling you that it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, amazing, sure. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, even for myself, I I kept thinking, God, you know, like where where is this taking me? Where is she taking me? It, it was my my you know constant thought, and 
and you know, even when I wrote, when I first started writing the character of Father Jerome into the book, yes, uh, I actually just started liking him so much. You know, I, I it's funny, I, I kind of almost felt that I gave him all the nice food and everything to eat because I loved him so much. I know. <laughs> in in I this, that character. lovely scene, the the um the the Victorian tea rooms scene, you know, exactly, where he's yeah. he's there yeah. with Michael and and in Michael's trying to get the measure of him, but at the same time, the reader is also trying to get the measure of him because you don't know whether or not he is a genuinely nice person or whether there's yeah. going to be an alternative side to him. Yeah, and you know, in fact, I myself at that time when they were in the Victorian tea rooms, I myself didn't know, you know, what Father Jerome was going to be like. It is only just as I kept writing him. I, I actually li liked him more and more and I think even you know because while I was writing him I actually had to take a break then to research military chaplaincy because I, I had no intention of writing about a chaplain and suddenly this chaplain appears in the book so you know I had to take a, 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 a solid break from writing to be able to research military chaplaincy it's such a it's such a very kind of a, what do you call it um, you know, specialized and specialized. Specific. Yes. Yeah. And they have they have their own unique take on on you know because they have to be soldiers and you know they have to minister to soldiers. Uh, they yeah. Have, yeah. And in in the case of the the, the Connacht Rangers, um, you know, where so many of the soldiers were illiterate, they were they were letter writers, they were letter readers. They knew these people, you know, inside out. They knew yes. their men inside out. And, and it was really impressive in the book how you highlighted that because I suppose because of, of the um, the confessional and because of, of the his understanding of, of uh, privacy, they felt they could go to him, dictate their letters, even the most intimate things that they wanted to yeah. say to their wives yes. and their girlfriends, yes. he would write yes. it and then he'd read back the letters from home sometimes with really intimate details to them too is a very it it's not the kind of thing a lot of writers would would know to highlight you know uh, and and you went there i thought that was very interesting yeah and i actually stumbled stumbled upon it by accident because uh, just literally because of the story you know the, the 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 news was quite heavily censored about what was happening in ireland you know news coming out of ireland was heavily censored uh, especially, especially coming into India because you know they, obviously they didn't want uh, the Irish uh, soldiers to to get wind. Well, they, they didn't basically didn't want people to know what was happening, uh, you know, with the black and tans. Yes. Uh, so uh, the only way the soldiers would have found out was through letters, and so I kind of nearly I was nearly forced to write, forced to think about how did these letters arrive, and most of the yes. men who were illiterate. So and and that kind of nearly nearly stumbled onto it and. And, and then wrote wrote it into the book. So a, a lot, you know, in a throughout the book, a lot of characters popped up unexpectedly into <laughs> bigger roles, and then I had to research that, you know, as I as I went on. You've so got a very creative imagination, super creative imagination. Now, you, you, you mentioned in the article during the week in the Daily Mail that um, you came from actually a military background. You were raised yeah. in a lot yes. of garrisons. Yes. Did yes. that help? Did that feed into this well for you, your experience as a child? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's, there's no doubt about it because, you know, you have, to, well, I'm not saying you have to have a military background, but, you know, having a military background gives you such a solid um, insight into, into the way garrison towns are run. And yes. like, even when my father, uh, and my, my father and mother got married, even to this day now, my mother would tell me, you know, when the first time how nervous she was when she met the colonel's wife. I uh, mean, you know, that's Whoa. in modern India, you know, in the fifties, and and you know how, uh, you know, the 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 commanding officer's wife was just as powerful uh, yes. with the young soldiers. You know, her word, her look, a look from her would, you know, would literally sort of you know, uh, say everything. So um, I I know this because my mother, you know. Uh, as you know, in India, most people eat with their hands, okay? Yes. And uh, my mother was, I think, maybe at her first or second regimental dinner, and she was using a knife and fork, you know, maybe for the first or second time. And uh, whatever she did, you know, she, she cut into a piece of uh, chicken, and the chicken leg then flew across the table. <laughs> oh, dear God, to her, bless her. Much to her, her, you know, her mortification. And uh, the very thing she was worried would happen happened. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. But <laughs> luckily for her, you know, the, the whoever the, the commanding officer was at that time, he and his wife saw the funny part, funny bit of it, you know. But interestingly, my, my father was called up the next day and he was told, you know, uh, your wife needs lessons in, yes. in uh, etiquette. In uh, uh, I, oh, I mean, as yeah, culinary. As that, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, uh, you have to have lived that to know how how much that chain of command was so important like and if, if you're if your commanding officer or your senior officer said something looked at you like it was just literally the law you know like you have no you had no way of uh, sort of circumventing it and then you'd understand what a big deal the mutiny was yes you know, the, the fact that they, they there was a mutiny at yeah. all yeah yes. yeah yeah, yeah, it meant that they actually they they um they stood up to that pressure that that yeah, respect yeah. that would normally have to be yeah, and, and also broke then with it. What, it meant, uh, what it meant for the officers because it was such a uh, a matter of shame. Oh yes, that the mutiny happened in their on their watch. Do you know? Yes. Oh, absolutely. And for you then, as as a child, what would your classroom experience have been? What would your your daily routine have been? in the garrison going to school were you very aware of the workings of the of the garrison outside of the classroom uh not really but uh you know whenever we when when you left like we we the schools that i went to were actually outside the garrison town and most of us most of us army children you know we went we went to a school outside the garrison town because um oh. you know the schools within the garrison town may not have been that good so you know uh, but we would we would be collected. Our, our school bus was an army truck. You know, an army truck would come and collect us. Um, I mean, literally, an army truck with a truck with a, yes. with a canvas cover would would collect us uh, as like as a school bus would, uh, and take us into the city to to wherever we, wherever we our parents were taking uh, sending us to school. But you know, as soon as the minute you left the garrison town, the the complete difference in in the physical surroundings. Because yes. the garrison town was always very neat, very tidy. You know, there was a sort of regulation whitewash. You know, everything was sort of spick and span. Uh, you know, all the roads would have been uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, signposted. Um, you know, there's a look about a garrison town in India, uh, which actually, you know, you can actually see when you go when you go to um, you know to the Kara in Kildare. The Kara, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can see shades of that. You know, uh, of the garrison town. Um, yeah, so it, must, it would have been like coming home in some respects. You could have been in India going through yes, the, yeah, the, yeah. the buildings, you know. Absolutely. Buildings, yeah. So I notice you brought a lot of very interesting um, uh, language into the book too. And, and I just, I, I, your, your familiarity with not just, of course, from having come to live here with uh, and over years and years and years, you know, living within Irish culture and picking up all of the Irishisms, like it's grand and all of that kind of thing. But yeah. you were able to go back and use what I thought was very interesting was you used language of the time, you know, going right back. Um, and, uh, you know, for, from just, um, I, I actually, if I'm just going to bring it up here, if you don't mind me reading uh, yeah. from the book for just a second, um, you know, just certain passages here. Um, yeah. so I think this is Tom, Tom Nolan, um, speaking, I hope I have that right. Jesus lad, I tell you why they were lucky. Now they're talking about men who died in hospital because they yeah. died in hospital dosed with opium and father jerome by their bedside think about it a year or, a year or two later they could have been rotting in the sludge of some rat infested trench in france gassed and dead with no absolution which would you prefer eh yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. that awful thought that although these poor men had died in hospital the way they yes. did yeah. they could have yeah. they could have died an even worse death and they yes. saw that, and you. I loved the, the 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 contrast you were bringing in there of you know a bad death in an Indian hospital being not as bad as a bad death in France. Yeah, and actually, that I think that little detail I actually got from, um, if I remember right, it might have been from some military chaplain writing back maybe to his mother or sisters. Uh, that I might have come across. I think that that's where I got that reference from. So you were coming across letters from the time, oh, yeah, were yeah. you? 
as I said to you, you know, I, I actually took a six month break to, I know it sounds a bit daft, but to, to, to just to research military chaplaincy, you know, and, and because I just that one small scene where, you know, Michael helps the priest to dress up, you know, to, to wear his vestments before yes, mass, yeah. uh, you know, I sort of went down a rabbit hole uh, because I didn't realize that there's actually a prayer for every piece of clothing yes. that's put on. You know, there's a prayer that's said. And I literally went down a rabbit hole, you know, looking at, you know, what every, what every vestment meant and, you know, the prayer for each one. And of course, I didn't, didn't use any of it in the book. But, you know, I... No, but they, um, would, have used, they would have used those prayers then. They, would, they don't use it now so yes, much, but they yeah, would definitely yeah, have used yeah, it then. So yeah. that is of the time. Um, and, and very good. And, and yeah. just the, the things that you mentioned, like bottles of pink, calamine lotion and milk of magnesia were arranged in precarious pyramids. You know, you've got such good visualizations there, ringed by a fine selection of eau de colognes and talcum powders, rows of tinctures, tinctures, syrups and balms occupied the remaining space. Talking about the shops at the time. And, yeah, yeah. You know, just yeah. really bringing in but the I visuals. Yeah, but there's lots of visual references, uh, you know, from that period, uh, Miriam, you know, in in, um, in some of the older magazines and journals like the, you know, Illustrated London Times and there's, there's a good few, there's a good few old uh, vintage magazines that would have had those kind of uh, visual references, drawings and, you know, photographs yes. and things, well, not photographs, not so much photographs, but lots of sketches that people would have made and sent especially to the um, the london illustrated times um you know they were they, they were literally what they said on the cover they were illustrated uh, articles you know and a lot of it had to do with the empire so um i'm just yes. such fun uh, researching those visual references absolutely uh, really and i noticed as well from very early in the book you you weren't afraid to to go for the uh, the salacious and you weren't afraid to go uh, to, for the controversial, mm -hmm. you know, early, early on, you know, Michael's, you know, he's, he's on days off and he's, he goes to a brothel mm -hmm. and, and he loses mm -hmm. his nerve. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. And you go through all of that too, but you also, for example, a little bit, I mean, it's only hours later when he meets Father Jerome in that uh, tea rooms. And of course the waiter comes over and does not yeah. want him there. Yes. Um, and only because Father Jerome invites him to stay, is he allowed to stay? But he, he, Father Jerome says, pay no attention to his manner, Michael. These Anglo-Indians all have a chip on their shoulder. They've mixed blood, you see, and are highly complex as a result. You're already introducing a, a taboo topic there yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and bringing and it know, to the fore. It, yeah, and it's funny because... Uh, Miriam, till that point, there was no, there was going to be no Anglo-Indian in my, in my book. Really? The book was about the, <laughs> yeah, the book was about the, and that, that one, that one uh, waiter coming, you know, the, the maitre d' coming, coming over and starting that, that actually set off a whole train of thought for me, you know, and, and drove the book in a completely different direction than, than I had intended it to be. Yes, so, it did, because you know, then I, you brought that, Rose in. Now, yeah, never intended it, the book to be about Anglo-Indians or mixed race people or any of that, you know. Uh, it's just the way, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know yeah, it and it's a lot like a painting. Often, you know, you, you, when you're painting a picture, it sometimes yeah. starts telling you what, yeah. it, what how yeah. it should be yeah. and when it's finished. And yes. I think very much the same thing goes on with, um, with writing as well. You're yeah. right. Um, and at that stage there, you also bring in the fact that, you know, the, 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 the powers that be, the authorities are also uh, quite anti-Anglo-Indian. So at what point did you feel you could bring a, whim a woman into the story now, a woman who would be Michael's love interest? Yeah, so I, you know, I know that you might find it, once you, when you've read the book, you might find it difficult to kind of get your head around the fact that I actually hadn't planned for Rose to be you know, at that mass that day, yes. you know, in, in the chapel, I just yeah. wrote her in. Then from the moment I wrote her in, she just became part of the story. You know, uh, it was really quite, uh, I, I wish I'd actually kept a diary. I, I really do. I wish I kept a diary of, of, uh, you know, how my thoughts were at that time, because I can't, I, I mean, I can only say, I can only tell you that, you know, when she, when she, when she walked into the book at that stage, 
she she just took over you know and and i i felt that i had to write her i had to write their story you know um it, and then of course you know once once maybe a few chapters later then i knew then the book was going to be about anglo indians and then of course i went down the rabbit hole of, of researching anglo indians and their whole story and that was just so oh my god that was so interesting i i had such a great time researching you know anglo indian social history because they have such an amazing story and because a lot of them were well educated a lot of them wrote yes. they kept diaries they kept letters um you know and and even to this day they have their own you know anglo indians have um you know have their own journal and yes and, and that's that is a device that you specifically brought into the book but you brought it in 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 a in a, in a different way to the way i've i've seen diaries being used before yeah yeah it's very interesting because you know you you you, you break the book up almost into three parts so you have the, the the part that takes us to the point where michael um you know he's he's met rose and and they and she is now working um mm -hmm. in the big house for yeah. the, the colonel's um uh wife and and then you go it suddenly shifts to to her first person narrative and she is speaking through her diary yes yes and it's it's but it's but the events she's dis describing are, are in part retrospect retrospective and and at the same time she's also conveying her inner thoughts it was a very unique yeah. i thought it was a very interesting device to use to to, <laughs> to peel those extra yeah. layers off layers. and yeah. start revealing yeah. her we now knew yes. a bit about yes. michael yeah but we really needed to go further. We needed to peel the, the layers off her in a different way. And the diary did that exceptionally well. I mean, I, I oh, really loved you. that. I loved thank that. And so, you know, you've got this conflict. She's obviously very much attracted to Michael, but she can't show any kind of uh, attraction because she'd lose her job. And slowly but surely, the relationship yeah. at the same time starts to yeah. blossom. And also, Miriam, she was so young. I mean, she was only 18. You know, yes. her head was notions that any any 18 year old would have at that time you know and plus she was motherless as well so you know she was the only one sort of uh, in control of her all the notions you know there was nobody nobody to sort of guide her or anything so you know in a way i felt sorry for her really you know as an 18 year old and mrs mrs aylmer her her boss is constantly watching her yeah yeah and yeah. you, you, you are clever in the way you bring in the fact that a lot of the reason they don't want her to join in certain events is because of the Anglo-Indian aspect. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, almost yeah. embarrassing. They don't want it, you know. So uh, it's um, you go into very interesting places. I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but it is, it is. Um, you can feel the tension of this, mm, and it builds mm, and builds mm. and builds. Um, and it's just she's got no support she doesn't have support from dolores cooper she doesn't have support from any of the women who feature in yes, the book yes yes um totally on her own totally isolated yeah, yeah. no way forward you know um racist um racism coming at her in ways that she probably couldn't even comprehend at 18 years old okay. yeah 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 really quite difficult and then you you change again you go to a third um device which i thought was very good in that you bring the whole story right up to the almost the modern day the 1980s 80s yeah 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 and work back again i mean yeah. it's it's yeah. really yeah. really interesting you keep us on our toes <laughs> well i'm glad you enjoyed uh, you know the way the book was split oh i um, thought it was wonderful yeah because i do you know i it is funny because i when i wrote the book uh miriam i it was actually alternate chapters yes so the, you know i wrote one chapter in the 20s one chapter in the 80s and i carried that on to the whole book you know include and spliced the diary as well in, in between and my mother actually was my first reader and my mother when she read it she you know she loved the book but she said to me she said i was a little confused i had to go back at every chapter I had to go back to one chapter previous to see where you had left it off, you know, because I was moving between periods, you know, every sure. chapter. Sure. And yes. Then when it, when my publisher saw it, uh, you know, sorry, when my editor saw it, you know, she actually recommended, you know, and I, I am so eternally grateful to her for that. 
you know, when the book went for, to the editor for the very first time, like literally they, she asked for no changes at all. Uh, all she said was, uh, would you consider putting all the chapters in the 20s together and all the chapters in the 80s together? And that's exactly what I did. All the chapters in the 20s were cut and pasted together and then the, you know, every alt. So basically all the odd chapters were put together and the even chapters were put together and that became the two halves of the book. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it was, yeah. I, yeah. I think it worked. It worked very well. Yeah, yeah. because what, what my editor said was, you know, her name is Joan Deach and she's absolutely, like literally, she is the most brilliant editor ever. She's just such an amazing woman. And she told me, she said, you know, by, by leaving, by, by leaving the book as it is, that is, you know, every chapter in, you know, alternate chapter in, in alternate time periods. Uh, she said, you're just going to make your reader work so hard. And why would you want to do that? Do you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think it's really made sense. So, you know, I, I didn't hesitate. I mean, I might have hesitated for a half a day and then I was convinced that she was absolutely right. And thank God I listened to her. <laughs> absolutely. Now we go through, we go through the book at, at um, at different points. Um, well, I was actually quite shocked at what ends up happening to the hero of the story. Um, I won't give it away because people will want to read the book. And then what happens to, of course, the heroine? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. and, and for a while you're, you're, you're presuming your own thoughts are correct, <laughs> mm. particularly with one of them. Um, and then you've got this incredible ending, which also, um, uh, you know, kind of leaves you wondering, how did, how did Corvery get from here to there? That, that, that's an amazing feat. And I've been thinking one thing and suddenly it's something else that, that yeah. unfolds and it's quite amazing. Uh, I won't give it away. It's, you know, it's, it's better that people read it for themselves. It was really, really a fascinating read. But getting back to Father Jerome, he turns out to be a really good egg in the end. He's trying yeah. his best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, he, he really, his commitment to his flock, you know, his commitment to the men was so huge. Yes. Um, and as you said, you know, he was a good egg. And his initial, you know, his initial uh, sort of attitude towards the Anglo-Indians obviously had, you know, sort of uh, changes as, as he gets to know them. Yes, and uh, and I think that's that's great because you know if you, if you can change when you you know if you can change your point of view, um, you know for the better, uh, that's a great thing. I think you know it is. It's uh, wonderful. It, it's wonderful. And and what comes across in this book, as I say, is is the way you know you know not only the two communities here, um, but you also have have you had the nous to be able to go back and pick out. Um, the voices of the Irish community and how they would have responded, particularly yeah, hearing yeah. about the 1916 rising, particularly yes, um, yeah. in their reaction to the civil war. You bring mm -hmm. all that through and that's the yeah. point of trigger for the mutiny. Yes. You yes, know, yes, and there's just yeah. none of them can get over that. You know, yeah, none of yeah. them can get around that. And it's, it's enough pressure. It's like, a, a, you know, a, um, it's basically, um, you know, a pressure cooker that has to, explode yeah, in the end. Off Absolutely. Now just going back to yourself for a moment there. I mean you you come over here when you're what 25 years of age, your husband has arrived over a little ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. Was it quite a culture shock? It, it was. I was actually only 24 when I arrived and um I mean it, it was a culture shock um uh, but you know not not the kind that you'd expect. It was really a culture shock nearly in reverse, you know, because Oh, you know, I came from such a massive city, 9 million, I think there were at that time in, in, in what was then called Madras, now called Chennai. And, uh, you know, to come to Sligo, which was so small and, you know, so lovely. <laughs> um, so it, it was a culture shock in reverse because, you know, we were expecting, like I've said this many times, you know, we, I've said it many, many times before that we, I was expecting, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll because I was going west, you know. Yes. And then come to Sligo and was so conservative, ultra conservative, even, even more conservative, uh, you know, on, on matters of sexuality than, than oh, India. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah, so what, you know, what so, year, what year are we talking about now? Over 86, 87? 86. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, would have yeah. been when I was leaving. <laughs> I would yeah. have, I left the country. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It was. And I mean, I think, um, you know, for for definitely for the more rural communities, um, although yep. we had yeah. we had what had we had by then, we'd had a lot of Cambodians come into the country mm -hmm. and Blanchettstown, yeah. etc. We had a lot of Chileans arrive in. You would have been going to an area where I suppose um, a lot of if you saw an Indian person, you did automatically presume that they were a doctor out of the local hospital. Absolutely. I mean, definitely in Sligo, because in the whole of County Sligo, we were only about five or six families and maybe about another eight or nine bachelor doctors, you know, yes. all, all men. All yes. men. There were, no, there were no single female doctors from India or Pakistan at that time. But, you know, the South Asian community, the minute you saw, you knew you knew that there were doctors and, and of course we knew everybody we, we knew the whole community because i mean that's just the way it was you know there's so few of us and uh, you know we, we all knew each other we socialized together as well a lot and, and then uh, of course it, you you had three children yeah yeah here? now my children were born my children were, were born not in sligo you know they were born in, uh, in limerick and, and dublin and uh, my eldest girl was actually born in england because we ah. actually went to we left ireland and we were in england for about two years and she was born there. She and, better claim um, her Irish passport now with Brexit. She's got to claim it. <laughs> no, she's always had an Irish passport. Oh, so, good, good, you know, good. That's yeah. excellent. So, so um, yeah, they're, they're as Irish as can be because, you know, my eldest Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Not... They'd have gone to school and they'd have just absorbed themselves into it. It's yeah, marvellous, yeah. isn't it? It's marvellous. Yeah. Now, so... You have a, you then, you, you've had your youngest child at this stage and you, you just, you're itching to write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I started writing actually when she was uh, 11 months old, I think, do you know, and uh, I, I'm actually really lucky, Miriam. I, I have a husband who's, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't even say supportive because, you know, he wouldn't even consider, consider it being supportive. It's just, you know, well, she wants to write and, you know, she has an, she has an equal, uh, need to fulfill herself as as I do, so it, that was just that it. That, I mean, that was well. Just well it, you, know. you you were you were a copywriter originally, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I mean, it, it's always been there. Yes, I, exactly, exactly. And I, I I don't think I literally don't think there's a single copywriter anywhere in the world who doesn't think they have a book in them. Yes. You know? <laughs> were you were you a Proving copywriter? It. Yeah. You've proven you it. When and I suppose I, also when, you know, you, you've just gone through an intense period in your life where you, you've given, you've given birth to three human beings, you're in creative mode. Any, yeah. any part of you that's creative is going to want to just bust forward, isn't it? It's Yeah, yeah. And I think there was a, there was a huge degree um, uh, of kind of nearly guilt on, on my part. I, I, I felt very guilty that my parents had invested so much, you know, of, uh, um, of themselves into my education and I, I and I felt that I had done nothing with it and uh, you know that that just bugged me a lot uh, you know I, I just felt my god you know my life is just going by and I never used my education you know my my parents really kind of you know put everything that they had you know every penny that they had was put into educating me and my brother so I, I did feel that I had done nothing with it and uh, maybe that was one of the things that drove me to, okay, let me write a book at least, you know, let me just do something with myself, you know. I understand. Uh, I understand. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I mean, this, this huge priority and huge sacrifice, isn't there, um, in different cultures on, uh, laid, um, emphasis laid on education and, you know, moving. Oh my God. It's in South, South Asia, like it's, you know, it's, um, it's so important. It, it's almost, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same as giving your children food, you know, if you don't, you, you know, you've only done half the job if you haven't fed them an education as well. So, yeah, it's a huge thing because I mean, the 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 the, the reason is is because it's the way it's the way out of poverty. You know, I mean, absolutely, the, the, way, to, the way to better yourself is through education, and that's what South Asians believe in, and that actually is the reality for South Asians when you're in South Asia. So, yes, you know, education would be such a massive big thing. A mm -hmm. massive big thing. Now, yeah, Paddy Indian, that's your first book. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's your first book. Oh, and, and how did how did your family feel when you published that? They must have been so proud. <laughs> oh, you've no idea. My my father was embarrassingly proud. You know, was he was he? at oh, the book wonderful. 
I mean, no, it's, an, it's, it's a wonderful book. It's an absolutely wonderful book. And the endorsements, oh my God, the endorsements that you have here. Um, you, oh gosh, you've even got Joanna Lumley who's coming in saying, warning, contains some dangerously seductive descriptions of Indian cooking. But it is just, what I found when I read this during the week, I mean, you are, you can really write uh, sensual scenes. You can write romance. You can... You really, that's, you know, whereas The Tainted goes in, in one direction and, and, and it's more historical, a historical romance yes, and, and yeah. everything's dealt with in accordance with the, the rules of the time. Um, this is much more modern and, and you find a different voice. You're very good at finding the voice for the decade, you know. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent at doing that. Just tell us a little more about this, uh, about Paddy Indian, uh, before I move on to the next one. Tell, tell us um, the storyline. Yeah, well, pa Paddy Indian is about uh, about a young Indian doctor who comes to Ireland and, um, you know, sort of finds himself slightly, um, slightly at sea because, you know, he comes from a well-off, wealthy, upper-middle-class family and then he arrives in Ireland and he's suddenly... Uh, you know, just an, Im an immigrant doctor uh, and, uh, and treated as such. Yes. And uh, it's a, he, he falls in love with an Irish girl, but it's not, a, it's not really a love story. It's more what happens between him and his mother because of the Irish girl. Yes. Uh, would you agree, Miriam? Would, would, would I you agree with that? Yeah. 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 Oh, so, as well. <laughs> so, um, but you know, it's it's strange, Miriam. That book was written twenty years ago, but literally, there's nothing in that book that wouldn't isn't even, relevant to uh, now. Still the, is relevant to this time. I mean, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in the health service. Nothing has changed for for junior doctors of of any color, whether they're Irish or you know Indian. I mean, the the working uh, environment. Nothing has changed. You know, the the pressure on young doctors is exactly the same it's actually quite sad to think that you know you i picked up the book recently and read a few pages here and there and i'm just thinking my god nothing has changed you know and the, the insights the that you so harassed the insights you yeah. will have had to that you know the uh, oh yeah oh yeah incredible yeah. you know um and then you you have of course a completely this this is you know again all the different voices with the uncoupling I just loved it. I mean, you opened the book. book um, <laughs> you opened the book with basically he's sitting on the toilet. <laughs> but this, uh, you, you, you come again, a completely different style of writing. Um, you just find voices, different voices so well. You must have the most incredible imagination, you know, just to be able. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm actually very proud of the uncoupling. I really am yes. because it was, it was, um, you know, very few people write about, um, you know, sort of, the, you know, a, a, an older marriage, you know, yes. a marriage in its, in its, in its latter years. Uh, uh, sorry, very few people have written about Indian marriages in their in its latter years. You know. Yes, absolutely. Um, and the sense yeah, of the also, coming to an end. Yeah, yeah, and also you know, sort of a, an older man and an older couple, you know, discovering sexuality is like you know really not even not yeah. much written about us. Well. So, and especially in India, you know, especially in India. So it was a very interesting book, and you know, people said to me, "Oh, did you write it from personal experience?" I said, "No." <laughs> <it's> not <laughs> Sure, your husband would have been going crazy. <laughs> I'm sure they've come up to him and asked, you know, what's this about? What's this? About? <laughs> but I really enjoyed writing that book. I really did. And again, you know, it was a peculiar thing because I, in in the uncoupling, it was it was I was going to write a very anti-man book. Uh, and when I say anti-man, that that's actually not even right. I was going to write a book from. The point of view of uh, of an older Indian woman, and you know how she was sort of, you know how her whole whole life was sort of, you know, sort of subjugated by this man. Yes. But I think in the end, I wrote a book that was very sympathetic to him. And what was? Yes, I do. I think so. And and what was the trigger for that? What? Why did you want to go that way in, initially? What What was the the, the seed that? You know, I I wanted to write a book about about Indian women. Uh, and, the, and the state of Indian women or the state of Indian womanhood or whatever you might want to call it. But for some peculiar reason, and I have no idea why all my three books and even my fourth one 
uh, you know, all the protagonists are men. Um, and, and that's something I, I've, I have never planned it that way. It's just, I have no idea why, but you know, I, I seem to write better with the, through a man's, you know, through a man's point of view. Um, and, and when I started writing the uncoupling, you know, from his point of view, uh, I actually kind of halfway through, I, I realized why she irritated him so much sometimes, you know, and I, I found myself being very sympathetic, you know, uh, e even though I kind of yes. I do condemn him quite a bit, but you know, he's, I am, I think I gave him a good bit of uh, a sympathetic voice as well, you know. Yeah, you did. Uh, it is a very, it is difficult to, to, to get that right. You got it right. It, it's difficult to, to find the male voice if you're a female author and and make yeah. sure that you've you that it's that it's constructed in a way that makes sense to other men when they read it did you give the, yeah. did do you ever um do you ever go to your husband with some of these texts and say look does this work or do you ever go to other male um friends and say you know you know do, what yeah. does no. this work does this actually hold together no you just no, no. But, 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 but my husband yeah, but my husband would al almost all my books, he's read them as I've written them. Right. Do you know? And, yeah. and he, he wouldn't hesitate to say, oh, that's shite, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't, like, I mean, he'd tell me straight away, you know, oh, that, that's rubbish. You, know, you throw or, the book at or, him or, then. It's... Or... Yeah. <laughs> so actually, The Uncoupling and Paddy Indian, both of them, in fact, The Tainted as well, you know, he read them as, as they were being written. Right. So in a way, it's unfortunate because, you know, you, you, you would not get... Uh, I, I, I've asked him many times, you know, would you not just pick up the printed book and read it? Uh, but then he'd say, oh, but I, I already know the story, I've read it. Yeah. You know, he's, he's not a big reader. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's read the books as they were written. Yes. You know, unlike my mum who, you know, when my mum read The Tainted, she read it as a, as a full book, you know. Yes, as a full book, yes. So, no, but Prakash would read, he would read all my books. And, and I really, really trust him because he wouldn't hesitate at all ever to say that it was shite or it was good or, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you need that. You need that person who's sufficiently close to you and who's intelligent and who knows, who knows what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. And can yeah. be the wall. You know, it's yeah. very, very important, isn't it, to have yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, I am just so excited about this new book now. I really am. And, and uh, you know, hopefully there'll be there'll be previews and, and we'll hear a lot more from you on this. Just tell us for the moment what you feel the future holds, though. You're 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 in COVID right now. We're, we're filming yeah. in COVID. Yeah. Yeah. You're down um, on your own writing away. Is is this heaven for you now? Can you just separate yourself from what's going on in the world outside and just immerse yourself in your writing easily? Yeah, no, it's hard. It's really hard, Miriam, you know. Uh, and I think because nowadays writers are so are so much expected uh, by their publishers, by, by everybody else, by bookshops, by everyone, you know, uh, to promote their books as much as they can on social media. So it's yes. very hard. Yes. You know, like you, you can't be on social media and not know what's going on or, or not be affected by what's going on or be sucked in by it, you know. So it's, it, it is very hard. And I, I try to sort of, uh, you know, steer very steer clear of, of politics and because, uh, you know, I, I would be sort of very opinionated politically and I would hate that to come, you know, that it, it would just literally consume me if I, if I started, you know, if I went onto social media, onto the political side. So I just, you know, I just stick with book Twitter, which I find very helpful and a very yes, a nice absolutely. calm place, you know. Um, I, I but, you know, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to get away from what's going on in the world today, you know, in terms of, you know, the, of COVID and Corona. Um, but I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to give myself till the end of this year, uh, you know, to continue to promote The Tainted. Um, but I think, you know, once I, once I get going with the next book, I, I will actually then just maybe switch off slightly. And, and just move on into writing my book. I, at the moment, I'm not actually writing it. I'm, as I said to you, you know, I'm doing timelines and, you know, um, uh, sort of, I, I, I want to do the, the my, my main character is a bus driver. So I, I want to actually do bus routes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I have to, and yeah, I have to drive. I have... awake at night saying, I've got to do that. And I've got to, do, I mustn't, mustn't forget. I've got to schedule this in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I literally I have to drive the bus route that the, he's going to drive, you know, so, yeah. uh, and I want to know the bus route really well, so, 
it sounds a bit daft, but that's what I've been doing the last three weeks. I've been driving up and down Bera, you know, trying to trying to figure out will I go this route or will I go that route, and so it's just very. I'm just doing the nuts and bolts. It's of so it, important once, to do that research yeah, because then yeah. you know the story will flow once you've got yeah, exactly, that right. Yeah. The rest yeah, will yeah. follow so easily, so, won't it? Yeah, yeah. So even today, you know, when I was, uh, I, I actually just finished a fantastic book by Marion Lee called A Quiet Tide. Uh, and it's about Ellen Hutchins, who was a botanist, the, the, Ireland's first female botanist. And she was from Ballylicky in, in, in Berra, in, in West Cork. And even, you know, even to, to read a book like that, just to get you, you know, really immersed into this, into the geography of this area, is, is fantastic. So invaluable. that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. invaluable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to immerse myself, like I did with The Tainted, you know, just immerse myself in books and, you know, like even even going to art galleries in, in the Bear Peninsula, even going to art galleries and looking at the paintings, you know, just gives you a notion of the landscape and, you know, yes. the way other people might look at it. And it's like, you, you don't really know what actually, you know, seeps into your book. Uh, but it does seep in, you know. <laughs> so. Absolutely, absolutely. So inheritance is the name of the next one. Yes, yes. Really looking out for that now. It's, it sounds absolutely amazing. The Tainted, the Tainted, tell us exactly where people can get it from. I'm sure it's available on Amazon. Yeah, well, pre pre preferably if everybody can buy it from their local bookshop because absolutely. you know local bookshops have been just so amazing. It's and I'm sorry, but I have to give a shout out to Gutter Bookshop and to Tulia Bookshop who posted my book out, you know, in the mid, in the thick of the lockdown. My books were, my book which launched on the 23rd of April in the middle of the lockdown. And yes. these bookshops posted my books, you know, Gutter Bookshop, uh, Bob from Gutter Bookshop, he posted my books out. And like, I mean, I, without their support, the book would have fallen flat on its face. And not just mine, other people who launched at that time. Yes. You know, we, we have such a huge debt to pay to, to local independent bookshops who yes. took the trouble. Absolutely. Uh, and and they are well. not getting the support they need. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I agree. please buy local from your local bookshop. And if they don't have it, you know, they can order it in. There's no problem. It can be ordered in at any time. You know, I mean, any yeah, bookshop, is, any local book. That is in. super advice. You're absolutely right, Covery. We, and, and, and really, you've given me something to think about there for Writer's Block too, to really ask the authors to do that. I, I hadn't thought of that before. This is a very good idea. Thank you. Well observed. Well, well observed. Look, I'm absolutely delighted to have had you on and I wish you, I wish you happy writing. Oh, thank you. And thank and you. Great thing, Dr. Well. Read all three. Absolutely. I, they, they are just fantastic. And you are, you're just such a gifted and inspirational writer. You really, really Wonderful. are. And you've got, yeah. You, you, it, there's always a surprise in every chapter, you know, you, there's an insight and, and very good research. And I'm just, I'm so delighted that Thank you came on the show. Thank you so very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Writers Thank Club you. with Miriam and we've had with us today, Kovri Madhavan, <laughs> and she's just the most wonderful writer. The Tainted, have a look at it, order it, go to your local bookshop, get it ordered in. And, and please also have a look at The Coupling and Paddy Indian. Now, you're not going to forget that name very quickly. <laughs> Thank you so much for being Thanks, on the show. Miriam. And I send Thanks. you all my love. Thanks, Miriam. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it too. Bye-bye.